current situation between Francis and the UFC is shaping up to be one of the biggest stories of 2022 and could represent a pivotal moment in the history of the organization. Without a doubt, this story exposes some of the UFC's shortcomings, but as tempting as it is, it's impossible to paint the whole thing in the broad and simplistic strokes of good guy versus bad guy. If this dispute was a simple matter of money, for example, I think it would have been resolved. In reality, when things finally came to a head, both sides were making demands with which the other felt they simply could not comply. That much is obvious by the fact that the situation is now an unmitigated disaster for the UFC. If they felt they could have reached a compromise, they would have done so. Instead, lines were drawn, each side took a position, and enormous risks were taken to defend those positions in what would ultimately become a showdown of epic proportions. The Francis wins or loses, there's a whole lot of different permutations that could develop and all of them have pretty significant implications. We are gonna talk about the Francis and Cyril fight because this just became the biggest fight in the history of the UFC. And Naturally, as an easily marketable slayer of giants with a tremendous backstory, on his initial tear through the division, Francis had all the support of the organization and of Dana White. If you had to bet money on one person in the UFC right now, having that it factor that's really going to be a transcendent star in the sport, who would it be? I like Francis Ngannou. I think Francis Ngannou can be the next big thing, literally and figuratively. The guy's a monster, and I'm really high on him. I think he's the future. I don't know if we've ever had a heavyweight that's been as big as this guy is. A heavyweight champion. A heavyweight champion who is as physically imposing and scary as this guy is. And I love his story. He's got a great story. He's, I, I, I think he's the future. How do you feel when you hear the boss making those type of comments? He made me happy. He made me confident. He said he proved me that I'm doing good work and what I'm doing, and he gives me a lot of power to continue what I'm, I'm doing. All very cozy. The UFC's support of Francis was evident in the tone of his first title shot. Just seven weeks after sending over him into another dimension, Ngannou challenged Stipe, who justifiably complained that at this point the UFC were putting all their promotion legs in France's basket. Dana was eventually hyping his power in terms of automobiles. His punch is the equivalent to 96 horsepower, which is equal to getting hit by a Ford Escort going as fast as it can. And it's more powerful than a 12-pound sled sledgehammer swung full force from overhead. You believe the UFC wants him to win? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Listen, I feel disrespected, but I'm not gonna like dwell on it. Francis was the anointed one, but it wasn't his time just yet. Stipe demolished Ngannou, wore him out in the first two rounds, and beat him down in the last three. In round four, the most intimidating contender the division had ever seen was reduced to literally nothing. He didn't land a single strike, 82 to zero in Stipe's favor, en route to a lopsided decision. I mean, I'm not the scariest, I'm the baddest. You're the baddest. It's unquestionably. It's going to take a lot more to take me out. A Ford Escort, Ford F-150, I don't really care. I'm going to keep coming. Francis was devastated by the loss, but immediately took it as a lesson. We all know his road to the top was exceptionally short. And as he saw it, it just wasn't enough time to have a full appreciation of everything the sport can throw at you. I think tonight I learned and I never learned in this sport since four years. I underestimate my opponent. I discover some new part of this sport and that I ignored about it. I've been for this sport only four years. I know that I'll keep learning and improving. And uh, what happened tonight was my, um, I think was the last step for me to learn about this sport. But this wasn't the last lesson Ngannou needed to learn. The sport would deal him many more, both inside and outside the cage. The next one came in the form of Derek Lewis, who was talking all kinds of hilarious shit. But now that I've seen that, uh, what's his name, Francis, he got 500,000 just fighting for the belt. Let me fight for the belt next. He ain't give me 500,000. <laughs> so I'm going to gas out too. <laughs> 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 what a way to sell yourself. If you're looking for an out of shape tub of shit to gas out and lie on the floor like a stuffed turkey, why didn't you call me? Lewis is hilarious. If you eat chicken for you, you eat anything. And that's just nasty. Although it didn't get him a title shot, he was next in line for Nganu. And in their bout, 
it quickly became clear Stipe had inflicted serious psychological damage on Francis. He looked like a broken fighter, nothing compared to his former ferocious self. Ngannou landed just 11 strikes, one of the worst fights in UFC history, certainly the most disappointing considering how these two fighters would typically match up. It was viewed as a disgrace, and Francis was now on a two-fight losing streak. To his credit, he was totally candid in the aftermath. He was an open book and spoke honestly about fear controlling him in the octagon. In the cage uh, for that fight, I was just thinking about my body, caring about uh, what happened the last time. I was like, that might happen again. If that happened again, it's not good. So try to control. So I thought about that more than I worry about it. Lewis confirmed that idea, that he had expected to face a lion, but instead found a scared little house cat. Whenever he first got in the cage, he looked completely different. I didn't even know if that was the same guy or not. So I, I've seen that he was scared. I know that he was scared in his face and he looked scared. Francis had a huge problem here, and there wasn't much sympathy from Dana. Obviously, Dana can't tolerate that type of performance. He's not in the pillow fighting business. He was totally right to criticize, but he made it pretty personal and really shredded Ngannou's character in a very unpleasant manner. He had a, a, a pretty quick rise here, and obviously the fight over Alistar Overeem, you know, catapulted him. I thought he was going to be the next guy. I think his ego ran away with him, big time. I can tell you that his ego absolutely did run away with him. The minute that happens to you in the fight game, start to fall apart. I had some personal encounters with him, as did other people in, in the organization. And this guy's ego just was so out of control. E ego is what hurt Francis Ngannou. Dana was making it out like everyone's been saying it. The UFC's intern who makes the coffee found Francis suddenly insufferable. His poor mother in Cameroon says Mr. Big Shot won't answer her calls no more. Even the boys down the sand mines were talking shit about his fancy hairdo. Dana made it sound like everyone in the world knows Francis has become an arrogant asshole. So while Ngannou was grappling with a horrendous fall from grace and must have had a growing sense of self-doubt, he was getting kicked while he was down by the organization's promoter. Those comments seemed to sting. I don't exactly know what he means by that. I don't know which people he's talking about. And I think that is something that you should ask him by his, himself. He's the one who can give the right answer of that. Were you hurt when you heard him say that? He, I, yes. This really was the first big public crack in the relationship, a clear shot across the bow from Dana. This critique of Francis Ego would persist. His own coach went in on him, multiple fighters piled on. Francis' arrogance was a narrative that took hold in MMA's collective consciousness. His performance and his flashy hairdo were all the evidence people needed that Francis had in fact changed. But while Dana may have won that little public battle, the war on this exact issue was far from over and would eventually tell a very different story. It's an extremely poetic part of this whole thing. I mean, it's almost too perfect. Because while Francis would admit that he had an ego in terms of confidence and supreme belief in his own abilities, he outright rejected the idea that he had an attitude outside the cage. I have an ego. That's something who hurt me to never stay down when I fell down. You have to be, have that ego when you are a fighter because that is what makes you think that you're better than another one, but not the ego to hurt people around you. Yes, I have an ego, I know that, but not to hurt people. Now that seemed like a feeble defense, or at least it didn't get a lot of traction at the time. But there is a major distinction between confidence and arrogance. And as it turns out, Francis would eventually show the world in the most emphatic fucking manner, exactly what that difference is. Actions speak louder than words, and Francis' actions would speak louder than anything Dana could ever say on the matter. There is simply no rebuttal for what Francis would eventually do. But that would come much later, because that was UFC 226, and on the same card, Daniel Cormier managed to yank the belt from Stipe, a result which would become the bane of Ngannou's career and an outcome which would see the relationship between Francis and the UFC strained to its limits. I'm 39 years old. Things start to hurt a little bit more as you age. You guys ever think about, like, I'm 39 years old, and I just did this. This is the craziest thing in the world. Honestly, in my own opinion, I do believe he may have had an ego. I think even after the loss of Steve Bay, he was able to get by for so long with just being a one-punch 
heavy, heavy-handed type of guy. And then when he got a little bit of adversity, he wasn't able to meet the challenge. And Interesting take from Blaze there, who was subsequently demolished quicker than you can say Francis is a one-trick pony. Devastate knockout, and Francis back to business as usual. Did you ever doubt that you'd ever get back to this moment? This might be my first time in the sport to be in this situation, but in the life, I used to this situation. I know how sometimes you can go deep uh, at the bottom, and then that doesn't mean it's over. Mm. You know, you can't overcome any kind of situation. Following that win, he was also asked about Dana and made some comments that would both serve as great advice for himself moving forward and that now, unfortunately, seem prophetic. Did you hear from Dana White afterwards? No. You know, there are something that I have, I have learned. Just do what you're doing for yourself and as long as you're doing your best, it's okay. Don't put your trust in people. Trust on yourself first. You are your first fan. No one give a love you than loves you than you, you yourself. It then took Francis less time to wipe out the old elites than it does for some people to wipe their fucking ass. In just 90 seconds of octagon time, he destroyed both Cain Velasquez and Junior De Santos. One vicious knockout and one whatever the fuck this was. Ooh, right there. A shocking three fight streak. But this is where the problems really began to metastasize. Francis was sure if he came through the number three ranked Junior De Santos, he'd get the winner of the scheduled DC Stipe rematch. But he did also comment on what would turn out to be a catastrophe for his career. Has anyone in the UFC confirmed to you that you would get the number one, the next title shot at heavyweight? No, no one has confirmed that. I think it's just obvious. Maybe if Stipe win, they might attempt the third uh, fight against both. Stipe did win, made some excellent adjustments, and stopped Cormier in his tracks, forcing a trilogy to decide the rivalry. As a result, Francis was left twiddling his thumbs on the sidelines for long stretches and was soon heard voicing a sense of aimlessness in his career. I think the problem is the UFC don't give much about me. I'm living out of this. I don't have like another job. I don't have like another income. I, can't, I cannot stay there like one year be waiting. I need, I need money too. They have to do something with me. So what is that? I want the I want the damn answer because they don't give me nothing. I don't know when I'm gonna fight. Give us something to hold on to. Give us a day. I'm not gonna be uh, stuck in on tidy shot or whatever. Just give me a fight. I'm willing to fight anybody. Like maybe it, it will be good to fight to fight out of my of my contract. Then I might have options because I can't keep staying like this. Like this. Rosenstrike got the last second win against Overeem and was scheduled to fight Francis in May 2020. But this was almost a year since Francis' last fight and didn't entirely reassure him of continued momentum. He was calling for an interim belt to give some direction and solidity to his career. He felt he was laboring in the shadow of the DC Stipe rivalry, to which there was now no scheduled end in sight. Uh, our division has been frustra uh, frustrating. It's going to be almost one year since they fought for the title. When is the next time for the title in the heavyweight division? No one knows. I mean, when, when is that fight, uh, Stipe and DC? Nobody knows. I, we request for the, for the interim title fight was some way to solve this problem, but they declined that. Despite his frustration, Ngannou went in there and Mali whopped the fuck out of Rosenstrike. 20 seconds flat, the empty arena made this one of the most sinister KOs ever. A short, menacing burst of ultraviolence, followed by abrupt and unsettling silence. While Rosenstrike was unconscious, it almost had the atmosphere of a funeral. It was like a bucket of cold water over the head for me. When you take away the fanfare and the roaring crowd, this can be the reality of the sport. Stark brutality and the unavoidable fact that no matter how you dress it up, this is just two men trying to hammer the consciousness out of each other's heads. It was an unforgettable spectacle. In the aftermath, Nganu continued to voice his concern about being left in limbo. And this is when he really began to speak about the prospect of fighting out his contract. The guy sounded ready to take up baseball or reapply for a more senior position in the sand mines. Obviously, I want to fight my contract out 
uh, from there I can still renegotiate my contract. There is not a problem about my contract. The problem is about what is going on in the heavyweight division. And that's what I'm expecting to do, to have a better contract than what I have right now. To erase my contract, to knock him out and sit down and have another new contract. But I just kept doing it, doing this sport because it was fun. I like it. I like the action. But lately, I realized that I'm kind of like losing those fun. Uh, and if I don't have fun in it anymore, it's not worth, worth it anymore. Francis would eventually fight one time in 20 months, 20 seconds of octagon time in almost two years. The guy felt like the most formidable fighter on the planet, whose prime years were just slipping away for no good reason. I mean, this guy was a number one contender and was eventually resorting to loans to pay his fucking bills. In the midst of this festering malcontent is when the idea of boxing really began to solidify in Francis' mind as potentially being the most logical path for a career he felt was being unfairly stifled by the UFC. Had he not been left idle for so long, I don't think the boxing idea would have ever become a priority to the same degree. I mean, I know for a fact that I'm gonna do a few boxing, a few boxing match. I'm not just about like a one shot. I want to make my own little statement in the boxing. There's not a doubt about it. I want to uh, I want to cross over. I want to uh, make a statement out there in the boxing world because that was my first love. That was my first dream uh, before MMA came around. Uh, I was all about boxing. I was swear swearing about boxing. The idea also gained traction in the boxing world with Eddie Hearn proposing a fight with Dillian White. And Ghana against White, the only thing is, do we go in the cage or do we go in the ring? I don't know, yeah, I mean, you'd have to be the favourite, wouldn't you? Apparently, Ngano wants it in the ring, though. I thought maybe me and Dana could put this night together where you've got a ring that also transforms into a cage between matchups. So you've got crossover fights. But Dana promptly shot the entire idea down. I like Eddie Hearn. Um, I've said good things about Eddie Hearn. Eddie Hearn said good things about us. Um, I don't think that's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not interested in that right now. I'm not, listen. We're all trying to get our businesses back up and running. I was talking to you guys about boxing for the last time. I'm not even thinking about boxing anymore right now. Now that is unequivocal from Dana. It's not happening. But it is worth noting that the boxing idea had gained serious traction with both boxers and a prominent boxing promoter. So it seemed more real than ever. And I'd imagine that's exactly how Francis felt. Right after the conclusion of the Stipe Cormier trilogy, Dana finally confirmed Ngannou would get his second crack at the belt. Even so, Francis was still unhappy with the fact that his career was entirely subject to the whims of the UFC. He was bound to his side of the contract, while the UFC could keep Ngannou on the sidelines at their discretion. I was expecting that I can fight maybe in December or something. He appeared that Stipe is not fighting until March. The only thing that I have to do is to wait until match for, for a fight. It's very hard. Technically, I'm out. I'm in my prime age, you know, and then uh, wasting time uh, being out without good reason. Time that I should be fighting. Ngannou eventually bashed the fuck out of Stipe in the rematch, showing the same ferocity of his initial run, but now with much improved wrestling, a better game plan, and critically more patience when the uh, journey is long when it's longer the reward is always more appreciable you know this time was a whole different story i came here tonight knowing that if it doesn't go my way i'm gonna be satisfied i'm gonna look at myself i'm like okay i did what i should have done i did i did what needed to be done and this fight put us in unusual territory francis was now the champion he had one more fight left in his contract, but his discontent was growing by the day. He had a desire to box. He wanted more accountability from the UFC. And to those ends, he was now adamant about fighting out his contract. There is an equalizer in play here, and Francis was intent on using it. This is a fucking emergency for the UFC, but they didn't appear to view it as such, as evidenced by the utterly bizarre sequence of events that followed. Among other things, Francis wanted to be able to make super fights, like welcoming John Jones to heavyweight. Now, I covered Jones recently, and I have to say, Ngannou and Jones were both speaking about their dealings with the UFC with a sense of utter dejection, 
sheer disappointment. They both felt deeply disrespected and criminally undervalued by the promotion. There is a very simple matter of respect that underlies this entire story. But I just feel like some sort of like disrespect, like they don't care about you. They don't care about what you feel. They don't care about your situation. That's how I feel about it sometimes. And that's what frustrated me the most. In any other profession, if you're unhappy with the way you're being treated or the way, you know, you're being paid or whatever, you can just take your shit and leave and, and go to the next boss and see if they value you more. First of all, I look for some respect. I'm respected to feel my right respected, you know, to feel like they care at least. That's that's it. I never ask for anything for for anything more than that. But um, it's just a weird feeling. You feel like you feel like they don't really want you there. But the UFC didn't seem to want to negotiate with Jones, and with regards Francis boxing, they never even came to the table. Instead of either of those things, and this just looks like hubris in retrospect, they wouldn't even wait a fucking month for Ngannou versus Lewis. Instead, they put an interim title on the line. For Lewis and Gan. Considering that Francis had previously campaigned for an interim belt, this absurd interim title was very simply a slap in the face. Francis could not accommodate them if he wanted to, due to ongoing visa issues, and the UFC knew that, so it was just the cherry on top of a big shit Sunday Francis felt he'd been eating for years. So, three days after my fight, they proposed me June. I cannot fight in June 12. Why? Because I have a visa issue. You know that uh, my visa needs to be renewed on May 20th. I'm not allowed in the U.S. in June 12. Then they came up with this uh, interim title. Yeah. Not to mention that uh, they have to give me at least time to like maybe go home and introduce the belt for my for my people, course, yeah. for my country, for my family. In the past two years, I have fought twice. And suddenly I have to defend my title after two months. What can I have the average time as everybody, three or four months? Gan mangled Lewis with ease, snatched up an interim belt, cementing his place as next in line. And in doing so, set the stage for the grand finale of this entire saga. A dramatic showdown to resolve the whole thing now loomed. By now, Francis had quite the list of grievances. A one-sided, iron-clad contract was at the heart of it. No, I did not sign a new deal. Uh, first of all, uh, I have a Daisy Champ clause. They've been, as I said, they've been trying to um, apply pressure with those extensions, but I do not sign a new deal, and I think that's basically my, the issue. That's what is causing all this issue, because I don't want to sign a new deal on certain terms. What does not work for me? Because I don't feel protected in those terms. In the past two years, I fought twice. I have to borrow money to live, and I have no protection. So uh, based on that experience, I want to get something better, a better time on my contract, and obviously pay what I deserve. Boxing had for the longest time been a dream for Nganu. But now having been left sitting on the sidelines and having been teased with multiple offers from boxers and promoters, including Fury, it was no longer just a dream. It was a demand, a prerequisite for any new contract discussion. At some point, I'm going to go after those money. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm going to go to that boxing, that's for sure. Well, according to what they said, I'm an uh, independent contractor. So what I want, okay. I can want a contract with a possible a terminated day. So after that, I can do whatever I want. So that's it. Or oh, when the USC and I, we, uh, we finalize it here, uh, the boxing uh, part has to be into it. You have to be able to box. That is a, a 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You oh, have to. 100%. Of course, Francis never accepted the interim belt. Why would he? It was a fucking joke. But beyond that, he was frustrated with the manner in which he had been presented in the lead up to the Gan Lewis fight. What's bothering me is the fact that to promote that fight, they were trying to discredit me and pretend like, oh, if you want to go in vacation, kill yourself, uh, when you want to fight, we are here. No, I want to fight. And I wasn't in the vacation. And they used the video from Embedded to play that game. Well, that, that's bothering me because that's not right. They know that is, is not true. And then it's just to discredit me. Just do your interim without sabotage me. And Dana's public position on the whole thing was basically indifference. Who cares what Francis does? If you want to be with us, love to have you, you know. You don't want to be with us, no problem. It's all good. He also blamed Francis' management for the insubordination. 
when you're when you're a fighter, we just had this conversation a minute ago. You got to be careful who you get to represent you because that's what they do. And uh, say I, I I don't think he's had the best representation. Okay. You know. You, you know some of France's demands, like boxing. It's understandable that the UFC wouldn't want to accommodate that. They can't cultivate the idea that high-level strikers can snap up the belt and then immediately punch their ticket to the big time. It creates the impression of a clear hierarchy between the sports, as if the octagon is just the back door to the boxing ring. It's a potential threat to their whole business model, but there were multiple other issues, and Dana sounded pretty dismissive of Francis' complaints. So even though they desperately wanted him to sign a new deal, on multiple fronts, it was almost as if the UFC were daring this guy to fight out his contract. But they pushed the wrong man, because as we now know, the heavyweight champion of the world has got two heavy weights swinging between his legs. He probably weighs 150 pounds if he wasn't dragging them big old coconuts around all day. The hardest part about his famous trip to Europe was probably hoisting his enormous balls over the barbed wire in Melilla. You know those strongman events where they lift those huge atlas stones? That must be what Francis looks like trying to pull his nuts out of his underpants every night. Because with one more fight in his contract, Francis took an enormous fucking risk against an incredibly talented fighter. He later spoke about having lost out in approximately $7 million by not re-signing with the UFC. If he fought out his contract and lost the belt in the process, he would be realizing that $7 million loss. He'd be going back to the negotiation table with no belt, no leverage, no appeal in the boxing world, no way to recoup that lost money. And he'd be presented a far less appealing contract than the ones he just turned down. It would be a disaster on every fucking level. And one that Francis would have to live with for the rest of his life. But if he could beat Gan then outside the UFC's little contractual clauses, he would have all the leverage. He'd be an indispensable heavyweight champion. They need this guy. He's the most intimidating man to have ever graced the cage. He's right in his prime, and he'd be on the brink of free agency to take on all offers and potentially cut the UFC out of any future boxing mega paydays. Losing Ngannou at this point might represent the biggest blunder in Dana's career. So this was just an epic fucking showdown. All or nothing. Francis taking on the UFC. Let's see who the fucking boss is here once and for all. You know, it's interesting that Dana once accused Ngannou of arrogance. And that Francis corrected Dana to say it was actually confidence. Because as I said, Francis' story would come to exemplify the meaning of and difference between those two terms. The way the UFC pushed Ngannou into a corner froze his career and ignored his complaints was total arrogance. But the manner in which Ngannou responded was pure fucking confidence. Win or lose, Francis entering that cage under the circumstances in which he did was legendary. And one of the greatest displays of both self-belief and just sheer defiance we've ever seen. His thoughts right before the fight were the philosophy by which Francis has lived his entire life. The entire reason this guy is where he is today. You know, this might look foolish. I could fall flat in my face here. Failure is a possibility. But I'm not living my life within the parameters other men try to impose upon me. So I'm going to take a chance here. I'm once again, for the thousandth fucking time, backing myself to follow this daunting, borderline crazy plan to the fucking end. And Jesus Christ, you have to admire this. The reason why I'm here is because I earned it. Nobody has given me anything. I made myself here, I earned it. So I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, but I'm sure I will make it. I will keep making it. If I lost this fight, I don't think that would take anything out of me as a man. Even if this was the end, well, one, I will say I did it. <laughs> you know, no many people in their lifetime, even those who have like better opportunity than I do, will tell the same story as me. So I'm happy with where, where, I'm, where I am. This fight was not an abrupt steamrolling. It wasn't easy. As we now know, Francis had damaged his ACL and MCL, which is a nightmare against someone as elusive as Cyril. After two rounds, it seemed like Gan had his number. He survived the deadliest stage of the fight, and it just didn't look like Francis was ever going to find a home for his power. 
but Ngannou made adjustments, shockingly implementing a grappling game. Initially dunk Ngannou like he was a fucking basketball. It all came down to the fifth. After a failed submission attempt from Gan, Ngannou controlled the round, and in doing so, took a very close but clear decision. It was a war of attrition, and above all, he overcame Gan with excellent fight IQ and an ability to adapt his game plan in the cage. So with pure grit, Francis beat Gan. But more than anything, this was always Francis versus the UFC. In terms of the fight behind the fight, there could only be one winner. And although it wasn't easy, although he didn't put his typically sinister stamp on proceedings, when the dust finally settled on this epic fucking showdown, the man left standing was Francis Ngannou. You know, there's a lot to be said for being a good loser. We celebrate that all the time. But Dana didn't even put the belt on Francis. There was talk that there was some reasonable explanation backstage. And who knows, maybe a seat opened up at the closest blackjack table and Dana disappeared out the back door like a Vegas magician. But it honestly seemed like he just couldn't handle the loss. The enormous power shift was just too much for the guy. And you know, I don't want to just shit on Dana, especially right now. You know, I think he's been exceptional on a couple of sensitive topics lately. But this is the guy who was once talking about ego problems with regards Francis. So it almost seems like the icing on the cake. That in the end, Dana couldn't bring himself to eat the loss with any grace and metaphorically shake the winner's hand by presenting him with the prize. You know, who's got the fucking ego now? Perfect, poetic end to the whole thing. Wherever Dana was, one thing's for sure. He was feasting on a big old jumbo slice of that humble pie. Just look at Ngannou's face here. He can't hide his amusement. Why, why, why did that happen? I don't know. You have to ask him. <laughs> so, so you did not have anything that no, you didn't no, say, I don't I want to. No, I do not have anything to do about that. Okay. I think that was their decision. I'm about to ask about that too. Okay. <laughs> um, and I guess that leaves, you know, Dana doesn't come to the... It's not simply money. Money is a part of it, but it's also the term of the contract that uh, I don't agree with it. I don't feel like it's fair. I don't feel like I'm, uh, I'm a free. But I think it's something that everybody should at least have a right, right to claim for what's best for him. We put a lot of work in this job. We take a lot in our body to make it happen. So uh, at least we can have a uh, fair and square deal. In his upcoming negotiation, Ngannou is the first fighter who will be legitimately calling his shots, not just as an equal, but as the man in charge. Francis is truly the champion who won his own freedom, and all that took to get there was risking almost everything he'd ever worked for. That's it. Francis later reflected on the nature of the gamble. I walked into, the, into this fight, no, I could, have, I could have lost this fight. But in me, I'm like, if this is it, if this is the end, let it be on my way. It's going to be on my way. I'm going to make the call how he ends. He won't end on somebody's room. He will end on my own rules, you know. And if this, this is the end, man, I'm happy. From where I came from, I have done a lot. Some people might not see that, but I have done it, and I'm very happy about that. I'm proud of myself, man. In the aftermath, Ngannou was totally emboldened and was finally in a position to bend the UFC over his knee and publicly spank the fuck out of their ass. The term of the contract, everything that they put into, they hold you like in captivity. Although you still don't have nothing, you don't even have a health insurance. There's a lot of things, man. We have no, no insurance, nothing. That's probably the thing that I hated the most about this, like how they hold or they got the power to like just destroy you as soon as you don't say yes for the uh, for the acclaim. He also really broadened his dispute to encompass more than just himself, to be about fighters who are powerless, who have no leverage to negotiate and can't speak out. In the process, he painted a pretty grim portrait of the reality for many fighters. The fighter 
fighters are not protect fighters are all out there on their own i walk around the gym sometime then you will see a fighter maybe he just lost a fight uh and then he's training then get injury he will take this injury like just hope that he heals up because he can't afford a treatment he's tough to watch those stuff you know and to think that it's normal no it's not normal you know that putting their body online for something at least a haircut even though he he know that he he knows that he's not getting pay enough but he can pass that opportunity because he has a, a machete on his throat so how come he's gonna fight against those system, the, the system he can't fight he's just gonna take it and uh, the power will keep getting bigger in the other hand and fighter will keep getting smaller in the other hand like there are people here who still fight for uh, 10,000, for 15,000. By the time that they have to fight again, they owe money, they have debts. So you can tell them like, oh, don't fight, just do union. They need to provide to their family, you know. And, and for those who like disobey and uh, try something, they get caught right away. The USA has the power to cut them at any time. Somebody has to, with a real power, has to show up and come support fighter on this one. It's amazing that out of all the guys who could drag these issues to the forefront, it landed on Francis Ngannou's shoulders. Francis later explained he felt the reason he'd been sidelined after the Junior De Santos fight was to put him under financial duress so that he'd sign a new contract. After the GTS fight, they wanted me to sign a contract and I didn't want to sign a contract by that time. And they just started to freeze me. Like put you down for 10 months, 11 months, get you go out of money. Uh, they know you're gonna go out of money because they know exactly how much you're making and they know that you can't go so f uh, very far with that. It's kind of like a way of forcing you to sign a new deal. So it is possible everything was always about the contract. He also stated on the day of the gun fight, he was threatened with a ridiculously frivolous lawsuit. And I'm like, what's going on? They told me that they just received an email from the UFC, said they're gonna sue him from talking with Nikisa. I don't know him pretty much, but somebody from Jake Paul team. So there were some tactics from the UFC that did seem a little unscrupulous. On the contrary, Francis didn't even have to take this fight. Like he's still not out of his contract. He has to wait for it to expire in December. And he could have done that without facing Gan. So it seems the UFC were happy to fight a little dirty, while Francis, despite the enormous stakes, stuck rigorously to his principles. In that sense, it is easy to frame this in the simplistic terms of good guy versus bad guy. And hey, the good guy won the fucking thing. When I get injured, uh, my team, though, I'm like, what are you going to gain into this fight? You're not getting money, you're not getting nothing if you sit down. It's the same situation. Be smart. At some point, like I'm yeah. doing this for the principle. Yeah, because this wasn't just a fight. Just I was just not fighting uh, in the octagon. This was like everything that I, I was fighting for everything that I stand for. It was way more uh, beyond the fight. It was for my principle. It was for things that I believe. My principle is still the same as day one. Uh, and uh, with that, with my principle, I will never be poor. So Francis took his big swinging coconuts and used them as a wrecking ball to demolish the status quo and is now assuming the role of an activist fighter in a manner we've never seen. Banging his drum, bringing issues to light. It is heroic. And he's now standing on the threshold of completely changing the game. You know, you have your pound for pound greats. You have the big draws and the new exciting up and comers. But right now, Francis Ngannou feels like the most significant figure in the entire sport. And moving forward, he will be treated as such. When you consider his now very bright future in the context of his past, his childhood working in the sand mines, being called an idiot for daring to dream, his treacherous journey to Europe, to now taking on a seemingly all-powerful organization while championing fighters' rights, you have to be happy here. Because... Who deserves that bright future more than Francis Ngannou?